Thanks for coming back. Let's talk about the osmotic diuretics next. So these are things like mannitol or osmitrol. Glucose and glycerin are mild agents that we can give intravenously to treat elevated intracranial pressure or orally to treat glaucoma. And then there's urea or urea fill. How do these drugs work? Well, they work mostly in the proximal tubule. They are filtered in the glomerulus freely, but they cannot be reabsorbed. So because they're non-reabsorbable, they produce this osmotic effect. Their presence leads to this increase in the osmolarity of the filtrate. And so to maintain the osmotic balance, then water is retained in the urine. It pulls the water into the renal tubules from the surrounding tissue and inhibits tubular reabsorption of the water and solutes producing this rapid diuresis. The drug's ultimate effect is that it increases the glomerular filtration in renal plasma flow and helps to prevent kidney damage during acute renal failure. It also reduces excessive intraocular pressure. The osmotic diuretics are used in the treatment of patients in the early oliguric stages of acute renal failure or to promote the excretion of toxic substances. It can also be used, and I've seen it used many times in the reduction of intracranial pressure or the treatment of cerebral edema. However, osmotic diuretics are not indicated for peripheral edema. They're not used in uh, edematous, peripheral edematous states or in outpatients because they have the potential to induce intravascular volume expansion and pulmonary edema in some patients. So we don't use them ever for that, the peripheral edema. Now, glucose, like mannitol, can behave as an osmotic diuretic. And the glucosuria causes a loss of the hypotonic water and the sodium, leading to this hypertonic state with signs of volume depletion. So you can get hypotension and tachycardia as a result of that. They have some pretty serious adverse effects. Most common and potentially dangerous effect is a sudden drop in the fluid levels. Nausea, vomiting, hypotension, vertigo, confusion, headache, cardiac decompensation, and hypovolemic shock. Also convulsions, thrombophlebitis, pulmonary congestion, headaches, chest pains, tachycardia, blurred vision, cheap, uh, chills, and fever. So you can see why these are not drugs that we're going to give outside of the facility. These are not uh, outpatient drugs. If we give uh, mannitol, it's intravenous infusion only. And it's important to note that it may crystallize when it's exposed to low temperatures. Use of the filter with this drug is always required. Uh, urea fill is an intravenous infusion only. Osmoglin or glycerin can be given PO, and usually if it's given, it's given for glaucoma. Of course, we would want to be careful and make sure that we don't have contraindications to glycerin or glucose. So as we move across our concept map, you'll come to the potassium sparing diuretics. Amiloride or Midamore, spironolactone, that's our most common one that you'll see ordered, uh, triametrine or direnium. These are also known as aldosterone inhibiting diuretics. Now the potassium sparing diuretics are typically not given alone. They can be, but not, not usually because of their limited ability to increase the urinary sodium accretion. Their major use is in combination with other diuretics, or sometimes we'll use spironolactone for other purposes, such as polycystic ovarian syndrome or in hirsutism. We can talk about the, we'll talk about those later in the third semester. Uh, but how do these drugs work? Well, they are potassium sparing. They work in the collecting ducts and the distal convoluted tubules, and they interfere with that sodium-potassium exchange. The reason they're called aldosterone inhibitors sometimes is because they collectively bind to the aldosterone receptors and thus block the reabsorption of sodium and water, usually induced by aldosterone. The ultimate effect being that it prevents the potassium from being pumped into the tubule, thus preventing its secretion. They competitively block the aldosterone receptors and inhibits its action, 
and the excretion of sodium and water is promoted. Now, because these are potassium sparing, that means that it keeps and holds onto the potassium, we can get um, potassium, too much potassium. With our spironolactone indications for um, spironolactone and trimetrine, or uh, trimetrine, excuse me, is hyperaldosteronism, hypertension, reversing the potassium lost caused by some of the potassium's losing drugs like Lasix or furosemide, and certain cases of heart failure. We'll see amylaride used in the treatment of heart failure. So when we talk about this hyperaldosteronism, um, there could be primary hyperaldosteronism, or it could be a secondary hyperaldosteronism that's associated with cirrhosis, uh, nephrotic syndrome, and sometimes CHF. Adverse effects by body system for the central nervous system include dizziness and headache, GI, we'll see cramps, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and other areas we'll see urinary frequency or weakness. But a big thing that we might see is hyperkalemia. Because these drugs work on the aldosterone, with spironolactone specifically, we may see gynecomastia, amenorrhea, irregular menstru uh, menses, or postmenopausal bleeding. Let's move on to the thiazide and thiazide like diuretics. So these are on the far right hand side of your concept map. These are things like hydrochlorothiazide or hydrodiuryl, acidrix, chlorothiazide or diuryl, and trichlormethazide or metahydrin. Our diazide like, thiazide like diuretics are chlorothiolidone, or hygrotin, uh, metalazone or xeroxalin, or microx. The thyroid thiazide <laughs> diuretics, like hydrochlorothiazide, act on the distal convoluted tubules. So they inhibit tubule reabsorption of sodium chloride and potassium ions in the distal convoluted tubule. And the result is that we'll have frequent urination because of the increased loss of water, sodium, and chloride. They're all excreted. Potassium is excreted, but to a lesser extent. They dilate the arterioles by direct relaxation. And so the long-term antihypertensive action is based on this effect because we have been a decreased preload and a decreased blood pressure consequently. So we'll have lower peripheral vascular resistance and depletion of sodium and water and some potassium. So what are our side effects, our adverse effects? By body system, central nervous system, we'll see dizziness, headache, blurred vision, paresthesias, and decreased libido. So this is one of the big reasons that a lot of times men don't wanna take the hydrochlorothiazide, that diuretic particularly. We'll see uh, GI symptoms, anorexia, nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. We may see um, Impotence in the genital urinary system for men, uh, integumentary system, urticaria or photosensitivity. Metabolically, we may see some hypokalemia, glycosuria, hyperglycemia, or hyperuricemia. There's other side effects that can occur that include things like orthostatic hypotension. If we are giving other medicines like steroids or amphotericin B, we'll have an increased potassium loss with hydrochlorothiazide, and that can actually lead to a hypokalemia. Um, hydrochlorothiazide also increases the risk of serum toxicity of digoxin, lithium, allopurinol, anesthetics, and any anti-neoplastics, and alters vitamin D metabolism and calcium conservation. So the use of calcium supplements may cause that hypercalcemia. And we should use this in caution, especially in people who are using herbals as well. So it's important that we do a complete assessment on our patients. I'm going to stop there. We're gonna to go to a third audio lecture where we'll talk about the nursing implications of the diuretics. See you in a few minutes.